Good morning. It's great to uh, be together this morning as we uh, launch into um, our summer Sabbath. We're just going to take a big giant break this summer. Right? Okay. Sounds good? Yeah, right. Uh, we are not exactly. Uh, today kind of marks two really important um, days. One uh, kind of big, uh, the other is just super personal. Uh, the big one is today is Pentecost Sunday, which marks uh, in the Christian calendar. If you remember last week, I alluded to Ascension Day where Jesus ascends uh, back to the Father and then he sends his Holy Spirit as recorded in Acts 2, uh, where once again, God's Spirit would dwell in and with his people the way he originally intended uh, to dwell. I think it's a redemptive thing. It's interesting to me, I, I think of this, because Acts Two recounts this as a pretty strange experience that um, Peter is preaching. Uh, he was actually, they, they were acting in such a way that people thought they, well, that's a whole other story. They were, he was preaching and um, there was a lot of folks gathered from all different uh, tongues and ethnic groups were all gathered together. And they all heard this message in their own language known as this, the tongues. That's how it's recorded in your Bible. They spoke in tongues. And what's beautiful about this is if you remember in, uh, I, th I think, this is, this is why I see this. In Genesis 11, uh, humanity had finally sort of taken and said, we can do things on our own. And they built this massive tower to heaven uh, in, in Babylon. And it was known as the Tower of Babel. And they said, let us, let us make a name for ourselves. Basically, essentially saying we can do things without God, sort of a celebration of life apart from God. And God scatters their language. This is in Genesis 11. And they can no longer communicate to each other. And this creates a massive continued separation that sin and sort of human pride and all these things tend to um, perpetuate. And so this happens until the Holy Spirit comes. After the sacrifice of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes. And he redeems or reunifies so we can once again hear and I think there's this, this unification of language where we learn to hear what God has to say in, the pre, uh, in his spirit. What Jesus would actually promise is that the Holy Spirit would be our provision for the way in which you and I are to live our lives with God and for God, for his glory, bearing his image in whatever circumstance or situation we find ourselves in. That his image isn't born in the fact that our lives work well and work out like we want. Our, his image is born in our faithfulness and allegiance to him. So we're going to learn about this as we look at this idea of provision uh, in terms of the Sabbath and where it comes from and where it originated and what it means to us today and specifically to us this summer. So thing number one is Pentecost Sunday. Thing number two is today marks the first day of summer for me. Summer, right? Summer is my favorite time of year. I love summer. Any summer people out here? Like, I don't even have air conditioning in my car. Like, I love summer. Um, I love it. And summer has a lot, and for a lot of you, 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 you love summer too, man. You're so excited for summer. And especially those, like, you have kids, and you're, like, so excited for summer, and you'll be excited for about two weeks. And then you'll be, like, waiting for fall. And the reason you're waiting for fall isn't because you don't like summer. It's because you can't wait to things. To, something has happened in you. You can't wait to get back to the way things were. When everybody has a routine, everybody knows their place. A lot of us anticipate summer because summer is kind of anticipatable. It's like, you know, it's got all the great songs, all the great music. Like we, we know all the stuff about summer that we love. So it's easy to anticipate summer. But what happens is we anticipate summer, and then summer gets here, and it's a bigger disruption than what we thought it was, and we're not prepared for it. So I want for us to spend some time preparing for summer. It took me a while to figure out how to do this. Summer has always been, for as long as I remember, my favorite time of year. And I remember um, years ago discovering this, but my life worked pretty well from September until the end of May. It worked really well. Because my family, I would get up, I would help get lunches, especially as my kids got a little bit older, high school, middle school, we'd get lunches, and they would all leave the house around 7.30, 7.27 to be precise. They were all gone. Wave them out the driveway. And then I didn't schedule meetings until probably, you know, at 9 o'clock a lot of times. And so what I would do is I have from 7.30 until 9 o'clock to, like, do my quiet time, to get myself together, get ready for my day. And it was just this, I just cherished this rhythm in my, in my life. This happened five days a week. And then summer comes. And summer comes and everybody's home. Nobody leaves at 7.27. And so I'm there, and not only am I like getting my breakfast, and I'm making breakfast for everybody in my house. 
And you think this would be sweet, right? Your whole family's here. You're getting to make breakfast. You don't have to be here until 9 o'clock. And here I am like, why am I so discombobulated and like a little angsty? And so I realize that, oh, yeah, my rhythms have been completely disrupted. And what you start wanting is for everybody to go back to the way that it's supposed to be rather than learning how to embrace what is actually happening in front of us and to prepare for these rhythms. So we're going to take and use this next couple of weeks to prepare us for some, we're going to provide some great resources for you to actually create some new rhythms during the summer that are already messed up anyway. And so I want to talk about using summer and treat it and say, what if it were? What if we treated it as a Sabbath? What if we treated it as a Sabbath? And the word Sabbath literally means rest, which most of you know. Shabbat. It's the Hebrew word where we get our word Sabbath. Rest. How many of you guys are like totally rested? It's like deep soul rest. You're right. We're doing really good. So I think of what I want us to do, because what most people do is they hear the idea of Sabbath and think they immediately got to take a day off or take a retreat or do this or do that. And those are all things. It, their time is, it matters. But this is not, first and foremost, a time management exercise. It is something else. And so I want us to focus on it this week. We'll get to some of the other things in the weeks to come. But I want you to consider something with me. Do you know where, where the Sabbath came from? Right, where the Sabbath came from. Do we, we often think that this idea that God just knew we needed rest to keep up with what, things were, what we were doing. <clears throat> and in our culture, rest seems to escape us. It seems to be a luxury for people who have an abundance of leisure time. If you have plenty of time, then you can rest. And rest just gets equated with a function of time. If you had more time, of course you would rest. But you know what happens? Your life sort of gets full. And what rest becomes is basically necessary for survival. And it usually looks like this. You work and you work and you give and you give and you go and you go and then you crash. And that becomes your rest. And if you get six hours a night or eight hours a night or two hours on some Sunday afternoon or wherever that may be when you threaten everybody in your household, if they mess with you, right, um, and you get two hours a nap or whatever, you get these sort of breaks and you call it rest, but it's not really doing what needs to be done. And it becomes sort of an act of survival. And rest is sort of the function of a couple of things. That rest, it becomes a function of exhaustion. You just can't keep going. And so you don't have any choice but to shut down or to stop. And we call it rest. And for some of you, rest is what you do when you don't, um, uh, when you just can't take it anymore. And you're just like, I'll just go to bed. And rest becomes a function of escape. Others of us, we use this idea of rest and we sort of like this because we like sort of the idleness. We, we sort of like the idleness of, of time and not having anything to do. And what I'll go ahead and say to you, um, if you're lazy, this message is not for you, okay? Um, if you're lazy, my message for you is stop being lazy. And then the rest of us, we're going to talk about what this feels like because we always feel pulled. And sometimes we're pulled by our own drive and ambition. And other times we're pulled by the demands that other people have, the demands of the jobs that we have or whatever it might be. But whatever it is, we are constantly pulled, and rest seems like a luxury that we can't afford yet. Can't afford yet. So I want us to look at this. It's interesting that you know that um, rest uh, makes the top 10. Did you know this? Sabbath? It's one of the 10 commandments. It's in the top 10. I kind of joked about this. This is like Hall and Oates in the 80s, right? It's like not quite Michael Jackson, but dude, it's close. <laughs> Number four. It's commandment number four. And what we read is a lot of us have heard this, that the commandment is to take a day off. And that's not exactly the command. I want us to look at this in its commandment form and then how it got to be or where it came from. And if you have your Bibles, um, we'll look at Exodus chapter 16. Remember, we're looking what God has to say to us. What God has to say to us. We're looking through the lens of his love and his pursuit and his, redempt, his promise of redemption for us. So this is what we're looking for. And so here is the command. Number four. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. This was, in that, this was created in the original design. We're going to talk about that more next week. But it comes into practice here in the Ten Commandments based on something that happens just four chapters prior to this in Exodus 
16. It's an invitation for us to stop doing for ourselves and to receive what has been done. In fact, look at it once again. Remember the Sabbath day by doing what? Not taking a day off, by doing what? Keeping it holy. What does that even mean? It means you're supposed to dress up and go to church, right? No, it's not what I mean. To keep it holy it means that there's something that has to be set apart. We have to set it apart, this time and this space, to set it apart for God's purposes and solely for God's purposes, for what God longs to do, what God, in fact, is doing. It's for us to sort of align ourselves with him. When we think about the Sabbath and this holiday, especially in our culture, where we sort of maximize time. That's, that's how everything is couched, being efficient. And the more time you squeeze, you feel like you've ripped off your Disney vacation. If you didn't get every ride or every fast pass and you just freak out because you didn't maximize your time or whatever it might be. And this is not about sort of prioritizing sleep or getting the right amount, you know, the apps that you have to make sure that your rest was exactly right. It's not about recovery it's not about maximizing productivity. It's about something else. What we're going to begin to see is that rest is not a function or should not be a function of exhaustion or of escape, but the invitation to rest is a function of trust. Of trust. That you can lay down and close your eyes or you cannot work and not be productive or not drive people, or drive things, or make things happen, and the world will be fine, and more importantly, you will be fine. That it will remember, you will remember that it is not your identity, that you are not what you do, you are something more. And all this is given to us, and it all comes on what we trust, and how we learn to trust. And this is, this is the narrative that we find this given to us, or this come to us, um, in Exodus chapter 16. Uh, Exodus just so some context is the story of the Exodus. It's what, what, where the book got its name. This is one of the, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. Uh, Genesis, Exodus. It's the story by which God's people are delivered from captivity in Egypt, known as the Exodus. They came out of Egypt by God's mighty right hand. Moses uses his rod, let my people go. If you've seen the movie, all that stuff happens. The people come out of uh, Egypt and they are going into the promised land. They come out of the promised land or out of, uh, out of Egypt. They immediately encounter the Red Sea. Remember this story? Moses parts the waters. They get to the Red Sea. They freak out. Why'd you bring us into the desert to die? The waters part or God parts the waters through Moses. They cross on dry land. And this is sort of the beginning of this, this exodus. And this is, this is it's a, it's a, actually a fantastic read. If you want to pick an Old Testament book to read, read Exodus. It's, it's, there's so many things in here. And so in Exodus 16, what's interesting is the Sabbath, what you and I would do is if you had just come out of Egypt and we're going into the promised land, right, when would you most say, this is when we're going to rest? We're going to rest when we finally get there. When we arrive, we'll celebrate by setting up our lawn chairs, kicking back, you know, and, and that's what we'll do. We'll, we'll rest there. But this was not a celebration of the arrival. This was actually given as a way of life in the middle of their journey. It's the way in which we're designed to do our lives. And it's not just for our physical replenishment. It's actually for the very provision for the lives that we most long to live, for the lives that we have been created for. And so Sabbath isn't some kind of reward for hard work, but rather it's an essential component to experiencing the life the way we've been intended to live it. So this is Exodus chapter 16. It begins... Um, with the Israelites coming out of uh, slavery, out of uh, captivity in Egypt. They come out, and things aren't like they want them to be, and they're not like they were. Because back in Egypt, they had three square meals a day, and that's what they're complaining about. Moses, have you brought us out in Egypt to die? Have you noticed there's no like Burger King or McDonald's along the way? Certainly no Starbucks. Where we're going to get the things that we always had when we were back in Egypt. We were going to get the three squares. And they start to panic and they start to worry. They start to grumble. It's what happens when things don't go our way or we don't have control of what we think we need. We start to grumble or complain or take matters into our own hands. And so they're ticked. They're like, Moses, have you brought us out here to die? At least we had three squares back in Egypt. 
You ever notice how nostalgia does it? It makes you think or believe that what used to be was like so much better than it is. They were in, they were in captivity. Like it was better there because at least it was predictable. And what we need to understand is that familiar misery is also more appealing than an uncertain future. And a lot of us just keep living in these kinds of patterns in our lives. What God is longing to do is to provide for us his spirit, his presence, his call to take us into the lot to the places that he has called us and to live the kind of life that he's intended, created for us and intends for us to live. So they're, they're ticked because they don't have money and they basically say, you brought us out here to starve us to death. So here's God's solution. And you find this in verse 16, uh, sorry, verse four of chapter 16. And then Moses said to the Lord, so the Lord said to Moses, because remember that God would speak to Moses and Moses would tell the people, he's mediated. I will rain down bread from heaven for you. And these people, the people, are to go out each day and to gather enough for that day. So here's the plan. Imagine the people are looking for McDonald's. You're going, hey, don't worry. God's going to rain down some bread from heaven. Like, sure thing. The people are to go out and gather only enough for that day. And in this way, look what he's doing. In this way, I'm going to test them and see whether they are willing to follow my instructions. And it's not to be read to see if we're willing to just do what God says. He's saying, I'm going to test them to see if they're willing to trust me. And this is going to be really beautiful in how he does this. He goes and he starts to set this pattern. On on the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is twice as much as they gather on the other days. And so they go on, they grumble some more. Uh, God does a miracle, and then they wake up in the morning. Moses instructs them in these instructions. And then he goes in, and he says to them, and let me just draw this out so you'll see what's happening. There are six days Right, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then there's a seventh. And on this day, how much are they to gather? Just enough for that day. We'll call it daily bread, DB. On the second day, how much are they to gather? Daily bread, right. All the way down. But on the sixth day, what are they to gather? Double it, man, two DB. Because there's gonna be enough for this one and for this one. There's a pattern that you're going to see. So this is how he's at, only get enough for this day. So sure enough, he gives them this instruction. He probably drew a cool chart like I did. Because you've got to make it clear for people. And then in verse 15, they wake up and Moses said to them, they said, what, they go out there and there's all this, this like wafer-like bread stuff on the ground. And they're like, what is it? That's actually what they call it, manna. What is it? We used to have a running joke when we were uh, years ago about what, what it was like, and we all we decided that uh, manna was like un- uncrustables. If you've eaten those, <laughs> a little peanut butter and jelly where the crusts are. That's probably what it was. Something like that. So it comes out as they're on the ground. So I'm just that, that's not biblical. That's completely Mike. Um, verse 15. Moses said to them, "It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded." Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person uh, that you have in your tent. So go out and get your daily bread. Remember when Jesus taught us to pray? Like this, this would have been fresh in their minds. Give us this day our daily, but this would have been what they thought about. So go out and get one omer. Take uh, to, uh, one omer for every person in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. I love the way this sort of The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much and some a little bit. Some some went out and they thought, oh, this is about it. You know, this is about an omer. They were trying to be careful. They're like the guy at the deli meat place where he gets to like, you know, you want a pound of meat. It's like a 0.98. You want one more slice because that might put you at 101. You know, trying to be that precise. And some people like that. And they're like, yeah, this is about an omer. And then other people are like, you think this is an omer? Like some got a little and some got a lot. So they're all trying to figure this out. I love the way this sort of looks and, and when you just sort of let your imagination kind of enter into the story. And what it says is that when they measured it by the owner, when they put it on the scale, the one who gathered much did not have too much and the one who gathered little 
did not have too little. Somehow in God's economy, there was a way in which when what we were doing, our efforts were sort of scaled out and even so that there was enough for everybody. And, and you, what you have to start doing is allowing your imagination. You can't like, we do this and we become afraid. Like, is this communism? Is this socialism? Is this, we got to stop all that and just say, God, what do you want to say to us? This isn't an indictment on any system. This is what is happening in God's people as they learn to trust him. And so they didn't have too much or too little. And then it continues on. It says that everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. And then Moses tells them, do not keep any of it until morning. Do not keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. You can imagine this, right? You can imagine if you had like, you got an omer, but you only ate a half an omer. You're like... If you got a half omer left, you don't have to worry about tomorrow. Why? Because you already have enough. And guess what you don't have to do if you know you already have enough? You don't have to trust God to do it. You see the picture? She said, don't keep it, throw it out, which makes no sense to us. But he does this. Do not keep any of this. So this is what is happening. And he continues on. And then it goes on. And it says, however, some of them did not pay attention. So they held on to some. And they kept part of it until morning. But it was full of maggots, and it began to smell. Joke's on you, so Moses was angry with them. Can you imagine that? You thought you were cool by putting some back. And you wake up in the morning, and it's like, what is that smell? Everybody knows, dude, it was you. And it's like, it's, everybody's just pointing. Everybody's got this. Imagine if that was the way things happened. It's also interesting to me to consider that suppose that when we that distrust, this unwillingness to trust actually begins to rot all the things that God longs to bless us with. Not only in our manna, but our relationships, all the things that we tend to grab and take and use for ourselves to make sure that we don't miss out on this life that we're trying to build when in fact God has actually given us a life that he intends for us to live, one that's full and one that's free. So what I notice a couple of things is that Sabbath, we see this, is a test of our trust. It's, a, it's also our willingness to live with God's perfect provision. Much of my life, and we, we are very fortunate, um, you know, that as you, um, you know, age and, and things, you know, just different things, different seasons of life, you have different financial obligations, different financial um, you know, income, all the different things happen. And for so much of our life, and even for our church, even people come in here and they look and they, oh, we've got tons and we've got plenty. And what we've learned is that we just have enough. We always have enough. And there are times when I've, I've actually wrestled with God. Like, God, listen, I've, early on, for the first, t- you know, 10 years of the church, it was literally manna. It was every, you know, every month that we have enough. And every month, I remember I would write bills and pay bills at the end of the month. And rather than going, God, I can't believe I don't have more. What I train myself to do is say, Lord, thank you. There was enough. I didn't have what I wanted. I didn't have ample. I wasn't like rolling in it. And I would always try to calculate how to get more. But at the end of the month, I just, I just decided and said, Lord, I've given. I've done what I've, you've asked me to do. And thank you that once again, there was enough. And at some point in time, I got kind of tired of manna. I'm like, God, could you, could you not give me like 4X dB? Like, let's, let's, let's do some multiplying here. Can you not do this? I, would, I, would, I remember thinking like, how long am I going to have to do the manna thing? We've talked about this as a church. How long are we have to be dependent on God to provide for us? When are we going to get to like make things happen? Do you see how quick that happens? Just like that. And what I've learned is that that never goes away. How long do we have to depend on God's provision? Every day for the rest of your life is what he told me. And I've got to decide if I'm willing to do that. I need places and ways in my life to remind me of those things, not only in financial realms and not only in my daily bread realms, but in every other area of my life. This idea of God's provision isn't just about your money. It isn't just about your time. It has to do with our sexuality. It has to do with the way we think about finances. It has to do with the way we think about stewardship of every, our bodies, everything that we do. Can we trust God with his provision for us in the things that we desire? Can you do that? What does it look like to do that? It requires us to walk with him. This is why he's given us his his spirit. 
And what you begin to see is it's kind of unfolding. There's an activity to trust, and we'll, we'll talk more about this. But if you keep reading in verse 21, it says this. So they begin to apply this. They've had the maggots, and this all happened, the maggots and the smell. And each morning, uh, they gathered as much as they needed. When the sun grew hot, it melted away. And on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person. And the leaders of the community came and they reported this to Moses. And he said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is going to be a day of Sabbath rest. This is the first time that word is used in the, in the Bible. Exodus chapter 16, verse 23. Tomorrow will be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want and boil what you want for tomorrow. Say whatever is left and keep it until morning. And so they saved it until morning as Moses commanded. And it did not stink or get maggots in it. Because can you imagine, right, if all your friends had saved it here and you're like a rule follower kind of person, you're like, am I really supposed to get two? Maybe I'll just get like an omer and a half. But you bring it back and everyone who had little had enough and you have, you're stuck with two omers here. And wake up in the morning like, I think it worked. Because you know, you, even though you'd seen the manna, you'd seen the Red Sea, it's still a, a place where you're unfamiliar and having to trust something new. It doesn't ever go away. You think just because if God did that, then surely I would never doubt him again. That is never true. Because the, the uncertainty of faith feels as uncertain every single time it comes, every single time we encounter this. And Moses said, eat it today because today is a Sabbath to the Lord and you will not find any on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there won't be any. God's going to take a break. We're going to talk about that next week. I love this. Nevertheless, some of the people went on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. And then Moses said to the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse my commandments and my instructions? Don't miss this. This sounds benign, like no big deal. On the seventh day, they just went out to check things out. But it doesn't really indicate that. It's like on the seventh day, they went out to see what was there. They already had enough but they wanted to see if there was an opportunity to get more. I mean, right, isn't this, isn't this the lure for all of us? Like we, we have enough and we're just constantly trying to figure out how we can take more. Because if we have more, then we don't have to worry for God to provide for us because we can then do it ourselves. And this, like, this is the human struggle and why this is so important, why rest is more about trust than it is about time. Because the reason most of us can't find soul rest is because the things that we want to control, we can't control, and we can't rest until they are under our control. And so you're working like a dog trying to get things under control, failing to trust that perhaps God has this in ways that you can't imagine, and he can provide for you in ways that you haven't yet seen. This, this is the challenge for us. In verse 29, he says this, bear in mind, he's going to make it a commandment later on, right? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are, and on the seventh day, no one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. What you need to understand is there is actually a process that is required for you to learn to rest. It's not time management. It's the process by which you learn to trust. That's the process. The way we talk about Sabbath is like this. You're going to hear this for the next 70 days. That's how many days of summer we have. 70 days. Sabbath is a time. Make no mistake. It is about time. It is a time set apart to experience rest. As we deliberately stop working and trust in God's provision. We're going to stop, we're going to cease, we're going to trust in God's provision. The invitation to Sabbath is to take a deep breath as we cease striving and place our worries and our cares at the feet of Jesus. So we need to take a Sabbath. And a lot of you are already starting to think, the thought of trying to take an entire day where you don't do anything is going to throw your entire family into jeopardy, right? They're going to like flip out. Or your work, right? Some of you are already excited about a vacation, and then as soon as vacation gets close, you start dreading vacation. Why? Because when you get back from vacation, all the things that didn't get done while you were gone are just right back on your desk, and you have three times as much work to do. And then you just think to yourself, I shouldn't have gone on vacation anyway. 
or whatever you're, so we're not going to talk about, right, taking a full day or taking a, you know, a week-long retreat. We're not going to add that stress to your plate. But I want you to consider what would it be like if, if we started with a Sabbath breath? What if we started with a Sabbath breath? Right, it's an invitation to take a breath and to cease striving to control and perform and prove. To stop, just to, just to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm not going to do that in this moment. And all the things that you are worried about and anxious about can just be sort of placed at Jesus' feet. It comes off of your shoulders for just a moment and you trust him. That somehow Sabbath, this sense of soul rest, is where we experience someone else holding our lives and, and maybe it's not even holding your life. Maybe they're maybe holding the pieces of your lives because you can't seem to get your life together. But it's those moments, it's those places where we find this. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of practice this, okay? I want you to kind of sit up straight. I want you to just kind of take a breath in, like just a deep breath in, a deep breath out. And don't, you know, don't overthink this. I want you to just consider, because some of you are hyper-stressed. Some of you are so anxious about everything that's happening around you and to you. Some of you are worried sick. Some of you are fearful. Right? Whatever, whatever that emotion is, some of you feel pressure because you're ambitious and driven. Like that's where my, my go there, man. I just like want to get things, I want to move things. Whatever your thing is, just take a breath and just sort of feel that, like all that, that anxiety and all the worry, all the drive. Just take a breath and then just sort of lay it right in front of you as you breathe out. Now I want you to consider for just a moment. If God were faithful to actually provide for you, to bring life to you, to bring peace to you, if he were faithful to do that, if you could trust him with all of those things that you're worried about, I want you to just consider that and then kind of take a breath in and just receive and just sort of say, God, you know, could you be faithful enough to handle even this? And you're just sort of asking him a question. And what he says to you is peace I give to you, not peace as the world gives. In this world, things will continue to be discombobulated. But I have overcome the world. Right? We can trust him and his provision. What God is inviting us to do is to trust him. So now I want you to just imagine that you could, you could really trust him with all those things that you're likely to pick back up 45 minutes from now. Right? What if you could trust him with all of those things? Then just take a breath in and just say, God, could you help me trust you with him for 45 minutes? And you breathe it out. Now imagine he's actually holding them. How do you feel? Or how does it feel? Just, just a, little, a little lighter? That's, that's soul rest. Right? We're designed to live from this place. And it's not only possible, it's the way we've been intended to live. So just a minute, I'm going to invite Don and Danny up and Leland and Newburn. But what we're going to do is we're not just going to, we're not just going to sort of promise ourselves we're going to do something. You know, also we're, we got 70 days. And I want for you to consider what it would be like if we just did summer together and treated it as a Sabbath. If we found Sabbath breath and Sabbath trust regularly in the next 70 days, how might you feel if that were a pattern in your life over summer? Well, what might fall look like? What might the world look like to you if that were the patterns? If you knew you could trust God more 70 days from now, then you trust him today. And if you found him more faithful 
70 days from now than you imagine he is today. And what would that do for your soul? But that's the opportunity that's in front of us. That's what God has invited us into. 70 days. You don't have to promise you're going to do this for the rest of your life, but I do want us to enter this season together. We're not going to just carve out a time. We're going to establish some patterns. So Danny and Don, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to invite Clay up. Clay is our campus pastor here in Wilmington. So y'all welcome Clay. Come on up here, Clay. Um, we have worked, and the thing I've appreciated about Clay, Clay takes all the chaos in my brain and just sort of helps funnel it into some <laughs> understandable yeah. direction. Yeah. yeah, that's what I do. And, um, and not only that, brings perspective and, and like, so this, this to me is one of the most, uh, this summer, because it typically says, oh, Mike's taking a break for the summer. That's not what we're doing. We are, we, this summer is one of the most intentional summers we have, we have planned in the, in, since the church um, to do this very thing. And what we're committed to do is to experiment and to do things together. Yeah. Our, our goal, we're, we, you know, you're going to hear some things this minute. It's not just about the resources that we're going to provide for you. Um, it's not about the content, but it's about, I mean, we want for you in the summer of all the disruptive rhythms to create patterns where you connect yeah. with God really personally yeah. through the summer, but also where out of that connection, you stay connected to our mm -hmm. church, even through your travel and all the things we know yeah. are going to happen. And in some miraculous way that we stayed connected to one another. Mm -hmm. Like we're going to have to use some different tools than what we've done in the past, but that's when we just need you guys to be a part of that so we can stay connected and prepared for what God is longing to do with us uh, and through us in uh, the coming season. So Clay has kind of helped yeah. wrangle this, and, and Summer's uh, just got real st strategic, and we've been prayerful about this. Yeah. And so you could kind of share with us what to expect and what we need everybody to do. Yeah, for sure. So to, to do Summer together uh, and to create these these rhythms of Sabbath rest and, and really to take these like Sabbath breaths, um, we're going to read through the Psalms together this summer. So that's what we're going to do. Um, and I think there's this beauty in the reality that Sabbath is this opportunity to cease striving, but also in Hebrews, which I've been reading my quiet time recently, there's this call to strive to enter the rest. So we're going to cease striving, but we're also going to do something so we can learn how to rest, right? And so we're going to read the Psalms together. And uh, honestly, we could just say, hey, go and read the Psalms. Read Psalm 1 this week. Um, but what we recognize is some of us need to learn even how to do that well. And, you know, for me, and I think for, for y'all, you probably picked up on it. One of the things I love about Mike is, is your personal um, walk with God, like how you walk with God daily. And you spend time with God in your quiet time with God daily. And we want to do that as well. And so we're going to lead you through uh, reading through and reflecting on the Psalms this summer. And uh, we're going to do that daily. And we're going to do that primarily uh, through our podcast. So I know we've mentioned this a couple of times, but we're really excited about it because it is a way for us to literally give you some pace and rhythm um, to reading uh, reflecting on, like actually like hearing from God and then responding to what God is saying to you. And so the podcast actually leads you through this in a way that's, that's slow, um, a, in a way that gives you space, uh, a way that makes you not feel crazy because it's hard to focus, right? And the podcast actually keeps you on focus uh, through the time. And so that's what we're going to do Monday through Friday um, every week of the summer. It's about so, a 10 minute, 10 to 15 minute thing. Yeah, right? it's really yeah. short. It's, I mean, yeah, some of them are like six minutes. Some of them are like eight minutes. Some, I mean, I don't know. We've done one in 10 minutes yet. And so it's going to not be long. Uh, you could do it while you like do the dishes. If you're really a multitasker, <laughs> I'm not. Uh, you can do it as you go for a walk in your neighborhood, uh, maybe as you drive. Um, or probably what I'll do is sit down at, you know, my kitchen table, open up my Bible journal hit play. As I'm listening to it, hit pause as I need some more time to read it, to reflect on it. Um, it's literally going to lead us through quiet time, and we're going to all do it together. And so that's what we're asking. It's not just, hey, it's a resource, it's available. We're actually asking you to like commit to doing this together to see what God would say uh, to us and through, through us. And so 
Uh, it's going to require some tech, uh, technology, which I'm not that great at it. But one of the things you can do is you can download the, the app, yep. which will keep you up to date. But also on the app, um, the podcast is like embedded in the app. So the podcast will be on um, uh, Apple Podcasts. It'll be on Spotify for all you cool people. Um, but it's also just like even on the app, you can like listen to it right there. And so we would love for you to do that. Um, it's also going to be in our daily devotion. So you can read it if you prefer that or you can read it along with mm. listening to it. And then one of the things that Mike is like, he is like dedicated to is this isn't just about me doing it. It's about us doing it. And so the, the, the challenge is we got to talk about it. And so if you're in a group already, you're going to have group content that will lead you through the Psalms. Uh, if, you, um, if you have a family and you want to do this together, you can do that. Or if you're looking for some com- community, I can't talk, uh, we're going to have a summer connect group, which is just a short term group through the summer, Thursday nights at 630 uh, down the hall in Studio 3. It's a place where you can just jump in any Thursday and participate. Find some people, um, find some community, and begin to learn together what we're learning through the Psalms. And so that's what we're doing. And that's what we're asking you guys to commit to and being a part of. Yep. Anything I left out, Mike? Uh, I think all the stuff is available on the website, right? Yes. You can you so, get all the information, vision, yep. um, all the resources on the website. Yes. Yeah, so check out the website, uh, download the app, uh, go to your favorite podcast provider, and let's do this together. Yeah. You all ready to do summer yeah. together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you yeah. all ready? Okay. <clears throat> well, we got a minute, so I'd love to pray over us and pray over our summer, and then we'll, uh, we'll go out and have some lunch, right? Uh, Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for, uh, for Mike. Thank you for the message. Thank you for this really incredible challenge and opportunity to learn to trust you, God, to trust you daily, to trust you with your provision, to trust you that your provision is perfect. And God, as we um, seek to do that, God, I pray that these rhythms of uh, this daily podcast in the Psalms, creating this slowness and this time that we just get to be with you and that we all get to do it together. God, I pray that it does something uh, in us individually. I pray it does something in us corporately as a church. And so God, we offer you uh, this summer, we just offer you these 70 days, God, that you would uh, teach us something, that you would do something in us, And God, that we would see uh, that we are more prepared to trust you and to live the life you've called us to at the end of the summer than we are today. Um, And for that to happen, God, we are wholly dependent on you. So come and do something beautiful in us this summer. We ask it and we pray in Jesus' name. And we all said, amen, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. See you.